Well, hello. It's 4th of July weekend, uh, Sunday, July 5th. I'm actually recording this on Friday afternoon, July 3rd. And as you can see, I am inside. My phone tells me it's 91 degrees outside. My deck really radiates the heat. So I have come inside today uh, to record this lesson. So we're talking today about salvation by faith. And if you'll recall, last week we were talking about the story of the rich young ruler in which he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, obey the commandments or keep the commandments. And then they went on, they had more of a discussion. And this all raises the whole question of where does salvation by faith come in? So that's what we're going to talk about today. In order to get there, though, let's do our typical review. And this time I want to do a little bit broader review so we can see where we've been over the last eight weeks or so. We've been talking about the resurrection. And when we talk about the resurrection, what we've been seeing is that Jesus rose from the dead in order to save the entire creation. Romans 8 tells us the entire creation is groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. And so that's us. That's us. And the reason the whole creation is groaning is because the whole creation has been subject to decay and corruption because of the fall of Adam. And so the entire creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed through the resurrection at the end of the age so that we can then take our part in reigning over this new earth, this transformed earth. So we as human beings are to be transformed into the image of Jesus in order to reign over the new earth, which is also being transformed. All of this was made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits. We humans are the second fruits and the rest of creation are, is, is the, the kingdom, if you will, that he's going to hand over to God at the end of the age. Now, as we saw last week, in the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, uh, he asked Jesus, what must I do to enter into life or to have eternal life? And Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He also said, um, things I have, the commandments I have kept, Jesus went on and told him what else he needed to do, which actually goes beyond the commandments. And we'll talk about that when we get to about slide 21 or so. But then also, as we saw, that wasn't the answer that we would have expected Jesus to give. If somebody had asked, come to me and said, what must I do to have eternal life? I would have said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent, place your faith in Jesus, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Jesus didn't give that answer. And as we read through the gospels, we find that Jesus never gave that answer. Uh, what he talked about, was obedience, 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 keeping the commandments. And then even when somebody was converted and, and transformed, his command to them was go and sin no more. Here I've got John 8, 8 11. This is the woman uh, caught in adultery uh, that was going to be stoned. And, uh, and Jesus came to her, her rescue and uh, the, the stoners went off and left her alone. And, and Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He said the same thing to the man uh, healed by the pool in John 5. We saw that last week. Go and sin no more. So when we have Jesus talking about obtaining eternal life, entering into the kingdom of heaven, entering into the kingdom of God, being made perfect, all through obedience to commandments, this raises a very serious question, especially for those who are uh, products of the Protestant Reformation. What does this do with salvation by faith alone? This is what we've always been taught, and that's what we've always learned, that salvation is through faith alone, not by works. And if it's by obedience to commandments, that sounds like works, doesn't it? And if it, but if that's what Jesus is telling us to do, where does salvation by faith alone fit in? Well, let's look at this. Let's first look at some uh, scriptures that talk about being saved by faith and believing in Jesus. And then let's dig a little bit deeper to find out what those verses mean. So first of all, let's look at the verses about salvation by faith. In Acts, 
Um, we have disciples who are being brought out of, of jail, and the jailers come to them. So they bring them out of jail, and they said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the disciples said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Finally, an answer that uh, we would have expected. Uh, it came from the disciples in Acts. And, uh, and so now we're starting to see what we would have expected to, to hear from Jesus. And Jesus does talk about it as well. On one twelve. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become God's children, to those who believe in his name. Now, this is the verse probably that we use when we think about receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Um, I think that we have sort of uh, 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 appropriated that language. I'm not sure that when John wrote to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. He was talking about saying the sinner's prayer. I think this was a receiving in terms of acknowledging who he was, receiving him uh, and welcoming him into their presence. It was that type of, of a situation. We have taken that, appropriated that language and turned it into saying the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying, I'm not sure that's exactly what it was meant here in John 1, 12. Um, so in John 3:15 verse that precedes the verse we all know, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then we get into John 3, 16, which repeats that, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. So now we're starting to see faith, uh, salvation by faith, by believing in Jesus. And th these are the, uh, the verses that we're familiar with. And it goes on. Most of these are from John. This is the will of the one who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. And he goes on a few verses later. Most certainly I tell you, he who believes in me has eternal life. Okay, so this, this is all familiar. Then we get into Romans. And this is where Paul starts talking about Abraham. And this is where, where, where Paul really lays down the argument that we are justified or saved by our faith, not by our works. And he, he says this in very fairly strong language in chapter 4, and dealing with Abraham. He says, he says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not toward God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted or accredited to him for righteousness. So, the, so Paul's argument here is that even Abraham, uh, who was uh, 400 years before the law was actually given, he was, uh, he was credited as being righteous because of his faith in God. Abraham believed God. And so he sums, sums it up in Romans 5.1, and forgive me for the typo, I didn't catch that one. And if you haven't seen it, then I won't bring it to your attention. Um, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So keep in mind, as Pastor mentioned in his sermon last week, uh, there are no chapter uh, breaks in, uh, in Romans, no chapters and verse breaks. In fact, one of the things I did years and years ago that uh, was very, very helpful. Uh, right about the time I got computer Bible software, uh, I copied and pasted the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans in my word processor. And I painstakingly went out and removed all of the chapter and all of the verse designations. Now, of course, you can find Bibles online that will already have that done for you. But this was, this was 20, 30 years ago, I did that. And I took out all the chapter and verse designations. And then I sat down and I read through the letter of Romans as a letter. Read it from start to finish, um, no pauses. And this was, a, for me, it was a major feat because I am a painfully slow reader. Uh, but I did it one sitting, went from start to finish. And I have to tell you um, that the letter to the Romans reads completely differently when you read it as a letter than when you go into it the way I always do and go into it and start take, tearing apart verse by verse, trying to understand what this verse means or that verse means. Read it 
as a letter and, and the, the gist, the theme, the whole point of what Paul is talking about just jumps off the page. So that's, uh, so I'm just reminding myself that these chapters and verse designations were not in the original. So the chapter five, verse one is a good summary of chapter four being justified by faith. So here we have, Ab uh, um, I'm sorry, we have Paul talking about Abraham and he's telling us that we are justified by faith and not by works. So far, so good. But then we have to look at the book of James. And now James says, apparently says just the opposite. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works? and that he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith worked with, faith worked with his works, and by works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that by works, a man is justified, and not only by faith. Wow. Did he just contradict Paul? He's even quoting the same Old Testament verse. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And James is quoting that for the proposition that Abraham was justified by his works. Now he goes on to talk about the, the, his works were an outpouring of his faith. And perhaps that's a way to reconcile the two. But there have been those in our, our, in our history, especially our Protestant history, who have not been able to see the reconciliation of Paul and James. And one of those was the father of the Protestant Reformation himself, and that was Martin Luther. Oh, my question. So which is it? Faith or work? Paul says faith. James says works. Let's see what Martin Luther had to say. See, Martin Luther did not like the letter James. He did not like the book of James. He said it alongside uh, Jude and Revelation as a sort of a secondary level part of the New Testament. You see, when Martin Luther, one of the things that he did uh, was he translated the scriptures from uh, Greek, Latin, Hebrew into uh, German. Martin Luther was a German. And so he translated the scriptures into German. And when he did that, he took some liberties, and one of those liberties was he relegated James, Jude, and Revelation to a second level, second uh, uh, tier level of inspiration. He did not like the book of James. At one point in time, he called it a straw epistle and, and making reference to uh, Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians 3 about things burning up as wood, hay, and stubble and straw. So... <clears throat> So in, 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 in his preface to his own Bible, his own commentary on James, Jude, and Revelation, this is what Martin Luther has to say about the book of James. He says, in the first place, it is flatly against St. Paul and all the rest of scripture in ascribing justification to works. It says that Abraham was justified by his works when he offered his son Isaac. And that's what James says. Though in Romans 4, which we just read, St. Paul teaches to the contrary, that Abraham was justified apart from works by his faith alone. That word alone in Martin Luther's writings, when it comes to salvation by faith, it was an important word. When he translated uh, the letter to the Romans, and he gets to the, the verse in Romans chapter 1, where it says, the just shall live by faith. When he translated that, that phrase from the Greek to German, he added the word alone, so that the just shall live by faith alone. And he emphasized that all the time. We have to understand and realize that every theologian, every church leader, everybody is a product of his own background. Martin, Martin Luther suffered from, and this is my own a lay diagnosis. I'm not a psychologist, but I've read enough that I think I have a pretty good idea of what he suffered from. He suffered from, I believe, a form of OCD 
obsessive compulsive disorder known as scrupulosity. Uh, he believed that he had to be perfect and any imperfection was completely unacceptable. And this was true with his spirituality. He grew up uh, having a horrible, horrible fear and terror of God, which is precisely what the, the church in his day wanted him to have. Uh, he, he decided to become a monk after one day when he was walking home uh, from law school of all places and a bolt of lightning crashed out of the sky and, and came very close to hitting him. And at that point, he said, he said, St. Anne, help me. I will become a monk. So he made a promise to St. Anne to become a monk if he got home safely. Well, he got home safely. Within two weeks, he had left law school and was on his way to becoming a Catholic monk. He became a monk. Uh, and becoming a monk did not uh, did not alle alleviate his fears of God. It only made things worse. And as one person once said, if anybody was going to get to heaven on monkery, it was going to be Martin Luther himself. He worked hard at it. He worked very hard at it. When he would go into uh, confession, he would spend six hours at a time in confession, confessing every conceivable sin that he had possibly uh, committed. He did this because in 1 John, we are told that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, that's a very nice formula. But in order for, to, to, for that formula to work, if you have an OCD brain, then you have to confess each and every sin. So he would go in six hours at a crack, walk out, leave, and then turn right around and go back because he forgot one. And he was tormented day and night, tormented with the notion that he could never, ever be good enough for God. He could never, ever uh, be perfect enough spiritually. Um, his, his salvation literally came when he was reading in Romans chapter one. And he comes across the verse, the just shall live by faith. And at that point, he realized that no amount of obedience, no amount of works was going to reconcile him to God. And so that was where he developed his doctrine on the justification by faith alone. And in my own humble uh, opinion, I believe that he lost sight in part of what it means to have faith and what faith means. So let's turn to another guy who also uh, spoke about this contradiction between James and Paul, my hero, George MacDonald. And this is what he said in a sermon that he once gave that was entitled, Faith, the Proof of the Unseen. And, and George says that about faith, they often used to say that it was antithetically opposed to works. And here he's referring to Luther and Luther's followers. There was never there never was greater nonsense to say that faith is opposed to works. They would say that Paul taught faith and St. James taught works. That St. Paul had gone too far and that St. James had to write that epistle to set him right. It is not for any of us friends that we will find St. Paul or St. James wrong. Nor was there the smallest difference between them. On the contrary, I assert that faith is simply the greatest work that man can do. So whereas Luther saw a clear contradiction between Paul and James, so much so that James was the straw epistle set aside to a secondary status in, in Luther's Bible, George MacDonald is saying there's no contradiction at all. Faith and works I'm, I'm tempted to say they're two sides of the same coin, but I don't even think George would even split them that much. Faith and works are the same thing. To have faith, you must work. Faith works, and works require faith. And faith is the greatest work that a man can do. George MacDonald talks about the struggle that it is for us to believe. It, 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 it is a struggle for us to maintain our faith because we have so many distractions, so many things um, uh, 
uh, fighting with us, fighting with our minds to take us away from faith. Faith isn't something that we just simply say one day, okay, I believe, I'm going to say the sinner's prayer, and then I go away and never think about it again. Faith is, is something that requires discipline, which is why Jesus' followers are called disciples. It all uh, stems from the same, same phrase. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? That's the crux of it. When we think about faith, what we're talking about are all those verses that I showed in the first few slides and many, many more throughout the New Testament that talk about us obtaining eternal life because we believe in Jesus Christ. Now, believe in is an English phrase. And I've got the, the Greek words up there on the, on the screen. And in just a second, we'll look at those. But as an English phrase, in America, at least, I don't know about the rest of the world, but when we talk about believing in something, the first thing we think of is, do you believe in Santa Claus? Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? Or if you're Linus Van Pelt, do you believe in the Great Pumpkin? Believe in, in that sense, simply means, do you believe that Santa Claus exists? Do you believe that the Great Pumpkin exists or the Easter Bunny exists? In that phrase, that's all that believe in means. Well, when you're five and six and seven years old, and the first time you hear the phrase believe in is in the context of do you believe in Santa Claus? It's very easy to take that meaning and that definition and apply it later in your life to Jesus. So that when you become a teenager and you're at youth camp and somebody says you have to believe in Jesus, it's very easy to say, okay, I believe that Jesus Christ exists. I believe that he died on the cross. I'll even believe that he rose from the dead. Therefore, I believe in Jesus Christ. And, and therefore, I have faith. That's the starting point of faith, but it's certainly not the ending point. And to believe in Jesus Christ or to believe in God is much deeper, much more of an ongoing experience than a single proclamation on a single day in your life that you believe that God exists or that Jesus exists. So let's look at the Greek words. Pistis is the noun form for faith, and it means to faith, trust, means to belief, refers to the Christian faith, conviction, or good conscience. The verb form, pistio, Again, forgive my pronunciation, I'm not a Greek scholar. Believe in, to have faith in, uh, with God or Christ as the object. Uh, believe, believe in, have confidence in someone or something. I got these definitions from uh, Barclay Newman's uh, a, a Concise Greek English Dictionary of the New Testament. This is the, the a dictionary that is attached to the back of my copy of the Greek New Testament. And so I, and it's, it's one that I find very helpful. It's concise, it gets to the point. Uh, it has enough detail that I can understand what it's talking about, but not so much detail that I get overwhelmed. So, uh, so that, it's, a, it's a good resource. So this is what these words mean. Now, think about this. If you trust somebody, and that somebody tells you to do something, Let's say you're a child and your parent tells you, eat broccoli because it's good for you. It will help your body remain strong. If you trust your parent, are you going to eat the broccoli? Well, maybe, maybe not. I don't like broccoli. That, that, that's not a good example because you can survive without broccoli. Uh, let, let's talk about, let's use a better example. Your, your, uh, your, your, your mother or your father tells you, don't go into the swimming pool without uh, sunscreen. Okay, do I trust you? I don't trust you. I don't believe that, that you're telling me the truth. Um, so I go in the swimming pool without sunscreen. I stay there for three or four hours. And I come out and I get blistered and I end up uh, uh, with sun poisoning. And, uh, and it can get worse than that later on in life. The point I'm trying to make here is quite obvious. If you trust somebody, 
if you have faith in somebody, then you're going to believe that when they give you a command, that they know what they're talking about and that what they want for you is the very best for you. To have trust in somebody, to have faith in somebody implies with it to obey them, to do what they say. And I believe that this is why we see Jesus over and over again throughout the New Testament, throughout those four Gospels, throughout the red letters of your red letter Bible, constantly telling people, obey the commands, obey the commands. It's not so much that the law was, was, was important to Jesus. It was the obedience that was important. And as we'll see in a, a little bit later, that what he really ended up talking about was obeying him, obeying him even more so than obeying the written law. To believe in Jesus, to believe in somebody means to obey them. And when I, when I think about this, I'm reminded of that scene in the old Disney movie, oh, it's old now, um, Aladdin. I remember that scene in Aladdin where he's uh, with Jasmine and they're running away from the police who are trying to uh, attack him and you know, or to capture him for stealing an apple or something of that nature. And they get to the, the top of the building and the only way out is to jump. And Aladdin turns to Jasmine and he says, do you trust me? And he holds out his hand. Do you trust me? And she says, yes. And he says, then jump. And he grabs her hand and they jump. She places her faith in Aladdin by jumping with Aladdin. She could have said, yes, I trust you, but I'm not going to jump. And at that point, I would say, then she doesn't trust him. To trust Aladdin in that situation means to jump. There's the story of the man, the tightrope walker going across Niagara Falls. And he's got this uh, uh, tightrope and he's going back and forth across Niagara Falls. And he gets back. I don't know how much of this is true, but it's a great story anyway. And he says to the crowd, how many of you think I can go across with a wheelbarrow? And all the hands go up. And he says, how many of you think I can go across with a wheelbarrow with a person in it? And all the hands go up. And he says, which of you will come with me? All the hands go down. And uh, at that point, we find out what faith means. We find out who really believes in him and who doesn't. To believe in somebody means to trust them to have faith in them. Yes, it means to believe in or to have faith in what Jesus has done for us on the cross and in his resurrection. It means to have faith in the, the reconciling work that Jesus has done on our behalf. But it goes beyond that. It means to have faith in him to help us live each and every day of our life. And to do that means to obey him. Now, on this point, uh, I turn to William Barclay, one of my other uh, references I like to go back to every now and then. And this is what he said it means to believe in Jesus. And he wrote this in his daily study Bible. It's a commentary that he's written and on the Gospel of John in particular. And this, this he was actually commenting on John uh, 3, 14, uh, I mean 15 and 16, which is what I quoted earlier. It means, believing in Jesus means believing with all our hearts that God is as Jesus declared him to be. Um, year, about a year ago in Sunday school, I did a lesson in which I questioned our image of God the Father as opposed to our image of God the Son. And if you're like me, you have a very different image of God than you do of Jesus himself. And the point I wanted to make there is that Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. If we have a different image of God than we do of, of, of Jesus, then there's something wrong with one of those images. And we need to bring those into um, unity with each other so that when I think about God, I see Jesus. And when I see Jesus, I see God. B, we must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that in him is the mind of God. That's part of what it means to believe in Jesus. But here's the third one, he says. We must stake everything on the fact that what Jesus says is true. Whatever he says, 
we must do. Whenever he commands, we must obey. Every smallest action in life must be done in unquestioning obedience to him. According to Barclay, that's what it means to say, I believe in Jesus. And so when you define belief in Jesus that way, then it makes perfect sense that James would say that Abraham was justified by his works because his works were the expression of his faith in Jesus. Turning now to George MacDonald. George MacDonald has written three volumes. Uh, this is what it looks like in my set. Um, in fact, let me do this. I'm gonna do this. I'll see if I can get this back. Unspoken Sermons, Series 1, 2, and 3. And um, these, are, these are some sermons that, that, that McDonald wrote. They're unspoken in a sense that these are not sermons that he actually gave in a church anywhere. They're, they are um, sermons that he wrote, wrote three volumes over the course of about 20 years. This is one of my favorite of his of his books. And if uh, that sounds daunting, there is a volume entitled Knowing the Heart of God. There's a companion volume uh, known as Discovering the Character of God. And what has happened here is a gentleman by the name of Michael Phillips. If you've read anything of George MacDonald, you've heard of Michael Phillips. He has taken those unspoken sermons, edited them, uh, and made them a little bit more accessible for 21st century readers. And he's put them in these volumes and uh, very good. These are two of my favorite uh, books. Now let me see if I can get back to my shared screen. And there I am. I, so I think this will work. All right, so George McDonald said this. He wrote this in, in one of the sermons in this uh, second volume of his unspoken sermons. The sermon was entitled, The Truth in Jesus. This is by far my favorite of all of his sermons. And it's one of those sermons that every time I read it, I underline it, underline it, and, and I've got the whole thing underlined. I mean, you know, so you can't figure out what's important and what's not. I've got about six or seven slides here of quotes from this one sermon from George MacDonald. I just want to go through them so you can see his heart and how he thought about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. To hold a thing with the intellect is not to believe it. A man's real belief is that which he lives by. Just as I did with Martin Luther, let me give you some of the background of George MacDonald. George MacDonald lived in the 19th century in Scotland. He was raised in a very uh, firm Calvinistic home. Later in life, he rejected much of Calvinism, and he became a preacher in the Congregational Church. Uh, George MacDonald had some, some beliefs about some of the doctrines that were not shared by his congregation. At one point in time, the congregation tried to sort of move him out by cutting his salary in half, and he said, well, I guess I'll just have to live on less. And that went on for another year, and they finally just said, hey, you're out of here. Um, but George MacDonald had a very simple view of faith, and that is what you believe in is the way you're going to live. The people in his church that, uh, that didn't like him, they didn't like being told that they had to live what they professed to believe. For them, it was enough to simply say, I believe in the atonement of Jesus, and therefore I'm going to heaven after I die. Don't tell me how to live my life. And what George is saying is, to hold a belief in your mind, to be able to uh, recite a catechism, to be able to, um, to talk about the atonement of Jesus, or, and to even say that you believe in the atonement of Jesus on the cross, that's not what it means to believe in Jesus. To believe in Jesus means to live as Jesus lived. And that's what he, that's what he, he preached. The essence of all of his messages goes back to this obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's, that's where this whole sermon, The Truth in Jesus, came from. It came from his background. But he lived at a time, um, especially in Scotland and later in England, where 
to be a Christian simply meant that all you did was you believed the right things about Jesus. And George MacDonald saying, no, 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 no. To believe the right things about Jesus is not what it means to believe in him. To believe in him means to live like him. So let's see what else he had to say. You ask, what is faith in him? I answer, the leaving of your way, your objects, yourself, and the taking of his and him, the leaving of your trust in men, in the money, in opinion, in character, in atonement itself, and doing as he tells you. I can find no words strong enough to serve for the weight of this necessity, this obedience. He says, it is the one terrible heresy of the church that it has always been presenting something else than obedience as faith in Christ. I'm just going to go through these uh, uh, quotes. You can pause them, ponder them. If you want, send me an email down uh, to the email address. I'll send you uh, my slide presentation so you can look at these quotes more uh, in detail. Better yet, go to Amazon and buy the, the unspoken sermons. He says to get up and do something the master tells you. So make yourself his disciple at once. Instead of asking yourself whether you believe or not, ask yourself whether you have this day done one thing because he said do it, or once abstained because he said do not do it. It is simply absurd to say you believe or even want to believe in him if you do not anything he tells you. If you can think of nothing he ever said as having an atom of influence on your doing or not doing, you have too good ground to consider yourself no disciple of his. There is but one plan of salvation, and that is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is to take him for what he is, our master, and his words as if he meant them, which assuredly he did. To do his words is to enter into vital relation with him. To obey him is the only way to be one with him. The relation between him and us is an absolute one. It can know how begin to live, but in obedience. It is obedience. So then it gets really practical. And as we talked uh, several uh, months ago, when we talk about obeying Jesus and obeying the will of God, we're not talking about you know, what career should I have or what church should I attend and all this. We're talking about the simple commands that he gives us right there in his scriptures. What have you done this day because it was the will of Christ? Have you dismissed, once dismissed, an anxious thought for tomorrow? Have you ministered to any needy soul or body and kept your right hand from knowing what your left hand did? Have you begun to leave all and follow him? Did you set yourself to judge righteous judgment? Are you being aware of covetousness? Have you forgiven your enemy? Whew. Think about that one. Are you seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness before all other things? Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Have you given to someone who asked of you? Tell me something that you have done, are doing, or are trying to do because he told you. I know what he whispers to those to whom such teaching as this is distasteful. Quote, it is the doctrine of works. But one word of the Lord humbly heard and received will suffice to send all the demons of false theology into the abyss. Let me comment on this real quick. What he is saying is, is the more we obey Jesus, the more we will understand theology. And at, in his day, when he preached this, the folks in his church said, you're preaching the doctrine of works. You're preaching the doctrine of works when in fact Jesus, uh, George MacDonald was preaching the doctrine of what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And that's not a doctrine of works. That's the doctrine of the scriptures. Tell me it is faith he requires. Do I not know it? And is not faith the highest act of which the human mind is capable? But faith in what? Faith in what he is, in what he says. A faith which can have no existence except in obedience, a faith which is obedience. And I think this is the last one. If I did not feel every fiber of heart and brain and body safe with him because he is the father who made me who I am, I would not be saved. For this faith is salvation. 
It is God and man one. God and man together, the vital energy flowing unchecked from the creator into his creature. That is the salvation of the creature. Oneness of man and God becoming one. And we can't become one so long as we continue to walk our way while God's walking his way. And that's the, 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 the point that he's making here. So when we talk about faith, the issue that is raised in the Bible between Paul and James is faith in what? See, the tension isn't between faith and obedience or works. The tension in the Bible is between faith in the law versus faith in Jesus. You see, in the Old Testament, the Jews had faith in the law, and they were obedient to the law. But what Paul is trying to tell people is, that's not good enough. Okay, the law served a purpose. It served its function. But now we have faith in Jesus. We place our faith in Jesus. And so for this, we come back full circle. Full circle. Let's go back to the rich young ruler. The first thing Jesus said to him is, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the young ruler says, I've, I've kept all these. Jesus lists a few, and he says, I've kept all these. But now Jesus tells him something else. He says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Well, wait a minute. That's not in the law anywhere. You're not going to find that in Moses. Moses never told people to sell everything that you have and give to the poor. But that's what Jesus required of this man. So what Jesus is doing here is he's telling this rich young ruler to go beyond the law. Don't place your faith in the commandments. Place your faith in me. Follow me, Jesus is saying. See, faith in Jesus, we sometimes think of faith in Jesus as being less than the law. Our bumper sticker tells us Christians aren't perfect, we're just forgiven. And we use our faith in Jesus as an excuse to live less than godly lives. <clears throat> but our faith in Jesus is to help us live more than godly lives, or live more of a godly life. We saw last week in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he gave examples throughout the rest of the chapter of what it looks like for your righteousness to exceed that of the Pharisees. Instead of not killing your brother, don't be angry with him. Instead of not committing adultery, don't lust after another woman. Instead of just simply loving your friends and hating your enemies, hate your enemies too. Every time Jesus gave one of these commands, he went beyond the law, even his command for us to love one another. The law tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. That's one level of love. Jesus' command is to love one another as I have loved you. That's a higher standard. Okay? Jesus loves me more than I love myself. For me to love my neighbor as I love myself, that's one thing. But Jesus tells us to go beyond that. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. That's a higher standard a higher level of love. So belief in Jesus ends up with a life of practical application, which goes beyond the law. And that was the tension that Paul had with the law. It didn't go far enough in regulating our behavior and our conduct. Instead, we must be like Jesus. We must learn to live like him. Belief in Jesus required that the man go beyond the bare minimums of the commandments. This is the way N.T. Wright put it. A young man must sell his, all his possession, that is to get rid of the idols, which were holding him bound to mammon instead of to Yahweh. And he must follow Jesus, that is give total allegiance to the way of life, which like the first commandment, was Yahweh's immediate and urgent summons to Israel. Okay, all of this goes beyond the bare letter of the Mosaic law. Finally, let's just see one more verse, and I'll finish. This is already getting longer than I wanted it to be. John 3.36, one who believes in the Son has eternal life. 
But one who disobeys the Son won't see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I point this verse out because in this verse, John is playing off on the positive side, the idea of believing in Jesus, but the opposite is disobey. And that is a different Greek word there. It's not, it, it, normally with a Greek word, to, to make something a negative, to, to say not believe, you just put an A in front of the, the word for belief. That's not what John did here. He, he used a different Greek word that actually refers to disobeying. So he's comparing and contrasting the person who believes in Jesus against the person who disobeys Jesus. And the point here is that to believe in Jesus is to obey him. That's the point. As we obey, we express our faith in Jesus. We end up possessing and experiencing eternal life, both now and in the age to come. And then finally, as we disobey, we experience present death, separation, and condemnation. The point here is I'm not focusing on what happens at the end of the age, okay? We'll get there. We'll get there. What I'm focusing in on is what happens now in this life. Jesus came to give us eternal life, and eternal life is a quality of life that we can begin to experience now. The more we live in obedience to him, the more we become transformed into his image, the more eternal life we experience. The less we obey him, the more of present death, separation, and condemnation we experience. Believing in Jesus is our way to eternal life. Believing in Jesus is our way to salvation. Salvation is not just going to heaven after we die. It's about being transformed into the image of Jesus, living like Jesus, becoming one with him. That's what eternal life is. We get that when we believe in Jesus, which is obeying him, trusting him, and doing what he tells us. With that, I will leave you. Again, I apologize for the length of this. I have no idea how long it is. I'll find out in a few seconds, but um, I want, hope you have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the 4th of July festivities this week, whatever the festivities there are this year, but enjoy them, and we'll see you next week.